Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings of this day. Now, Lord, speak to us from your word. I think you still have one more, one more surprise for us. Send your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. On the Thursday night before Jesus would die, in his final words before his crucifixion, meeting with his disciples in the upper room, he would make this statement. It's found in John chapter 16, verse, starting in verse 7. Jesus said, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Nobody in the room believed that. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So Jesus said the advocate will come and prove the world wrong. I hate finding out I've been wrong. We're on week three of our brief fall series entitled Fresh Wind. This series is going to run for three more Sabbaths and we'll wrap up with Festival Sabbath on November 18. We are for this series in the book of Acts considering various stories where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon people like you and like me and then asking our, ourselves the question, what impact did the coming of the Spirit have in that person's life? And we're asking ourselves many questions beyond that, but there's another one we're keeping particularly in mind, and that is, what would I become if the Holy Spirit fell on me? Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this advocate that Jesus speaks about, we can easily identify as the Holy Spirit. And what does Jesus say will be some of the impact of when this advocate comes? Well, John 16, verse 8, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Today's story from the book of Acts is about a man who found out he was wrong. How do you feel when you find out you've been wrong? You know you've been wrong, right? That's not news, I hope. How do you feel when you find out you've been wrong? We go to the story, or more specifically, we go to where we left off last Sabbath, Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 55. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they, this is the Sanhedrin who was gathered listening, at this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Now notice this next part. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, chapter 8, verse 1, notice these words. And Saul approved of their killing him. Such a contrast, right, between Stephen and Saul. Stephen being stoned, and he says, Lord, don't hold it against him. And Saul holding the coat saying, he deserves to die. It's quite a contrast, isn't it? Contrast, though, in one way, they're not different at all. They're not different at all in the intensity of their convictions, nor are they different in their willingness to act their convictions to the end, are they? Two young men, both convicted. 
Their zeal was the same. It's just their convictions that were opposite. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So, let's just stop for a moment and ask ourselves a question or two. Were Saul's actions wrong? What do you think? Is it, is it okay to go drag people off, innocent people, drag them off and put them in prison? Is that okay? No, it's not. So yes, his actions were wrong. Follow-up question. Was Saul evil? Now, well, that's trickier, isn't it? It seems like an easy question, but in fact, it's a rather difficult one, for you see, it was zeal for God and for God's people that was driving Saul to his action, or at least that is Saul's, or as he would later be called, Paul's self-assessment. Acts 22, beginning in verse 2, the last part, then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. He's talking about Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. All of which brings us to a rather troubling mental conundrum. Is it possible to be wrong but not be evil? And then a couple corollary questions. Are evil acts always easy to identify? And are those who do what we consider to be evil acts themselves automatically evil? On Friday, October 20, the city of Raqqa in Syria, the place that had become known as the capital of ISIS, fell to American-backed Syrian Democratic forces. The sins of ISIS are not a new subject, but with the overthrow of this ISIS stronghold, the extent of the, dare we say, evil is becoming shockingly incontrovertible. I think myself not out on a limb to say ISIS has done much evil, and that if we even knew a tenth of it, we would be horrified. And I think it not a stretch to suggest that ISIS is filled with evil men. But are they all evil? Are some of them maybe just wrong? Maybe we could live with the notion that some of the lesser players are not evil, but rather just wrong. But what about the leaders? Could any of them actually be very zealous for God, but at the same time simply be wrong? What if? What if one of the leaders of ISIS, with a verifiable history of persecution and even being party to death of Christian men and women, What if that leader suddenly claimed a conversion and became a Christian evangelist? Would that be okay? Or would we be pretty sure he should do time? Now, I will grant you this is an extreme example, but is it really that far from the reality of Saul, who was involved in putting Christian men and women to death? Such thinking, I mean, such thinking potentially puts a somewhat different spin on Paul's claim. You remember? He said, I, the chief of all sinners, and we're like, we roll our eyes, and we're like, oh, come on, Paul, you wrote the whole New Testament. You're a sinner, yeah, sure. Well, maybe he was. Maybe that's not so far-fetched after all. The text in Acts chapter 8 diverges for a bit and follows the story of Philip, the second named of the seven so-called deacons of Acts 6. Stephen was one of them. But here's the irony. 
the persecutions of Saul in Jerusalem actually had the opposite effect of what he meant to do. So here's what you had. You had this church that got going and was doing really well in Jerusalem. And you know what a church tends to do when it's doing really well? It tends to just keep doing really well right where it is. But Jesus had said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Ironically, Saul's persecution Instead of crushing this fledgling fledgling church, yeah, it hurt the church in Jerusalem, but Saul was the first impetus that caused the church to extend beyond the walls of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1, chapter 8, verse 1, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered, where? Throughout Judea and Samaria. Where did Jesus say the gospel would go after Jerusalem? Judea and Samaria. Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit comes on you, what do you become? You become a witness. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Saul was the first great evangelist of the church even before he believed in Jesus because he drove the church out of its comfort zone and into the countryside. And once again, we see the sovereignty of God. We've talked about this God before, the one who referred to King Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. The one who called Cyrus, king of Persia, his anointed one. The heathen and the persecutor and even the believer who is dead wrong may bluster and rage and believe they are acting in their own power and according to their own purpose. But when it is all done, often it is not hard at all to see that God has been working his will even through those that defied his name. So you know what this means. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. Remember that word, hupomone? We talked about that a long time ago. Patient endurance because the very thing that we might think is a curse may in fact be something God is using to spread his word or preserve his word or transform the world. We've got to endure in faith because we can never fully know all that is happening and we can never fully know who the Lord in His sovereign authority is calling to do His work. Nobody would have believed Saul was being called by the Lord. So after the interlude that briefly tracks Philip's ministry in Acts 8, we find these words, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. It's ironic whether or not Saul realized his efforts to purge Jerusalem was the reason there were believers in Damascus in the first place. We're not told. But one of the special things about being wrong, let me know if you've learned this lesson, one of the very special things about being wrong, just because your strategy has to date failed in every way and even made things worse, doesn't mean you're going to change course, right? That's the beauty of being wrong. You just keep doing it. I hate the way that being wrong makes me blind. But enough about me, back to Saul, Acts 9 verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. This story of Saul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road will be retold two more times in the book of Acts, in chapters 22 and 26. And in each telling of this story, different details are brought out in different ways. 
And this reality with how Paul tells this story should be instructive for us when it comes to our not infrequent obsession with attempting to nail down exactly how biblical events transpired and exactly how the future is going to happen. Here's the point. It's more important for us to grasp the fullness of the meaning of the Bible stories than it is to obsess over potential conflicts in details or minutia within the stories. Saul tells his conversion story in three different places. And it's obvious in each case he's telling the same story even if the details, including the exact words that Jesus spoke to him, change. The point, in each telling, the point is that we would get the point Paul is trying to make each time he tells the story, not that we would lose our way in the story because we put it into an over-literalistic framework. Let the Bible speak. Don't argue about everything. Let the Bible speak. The point so far in this story is this. Jesus has just intervened dramatically in the life of Saul and in the story of the early church. And now a persecutor is about to become an evangelist. Verse 7, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he, couldn't, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into, into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I've often wondered what became of the men who were traveling with Saul. Obviously in the moment they're stunned by what has happened. But what did they do? These are the men that came with Saul to arrest believers and take them back to Jerusalem. What did they do after they led a now blind Saul into town? Luke doesn't tell us in the book of Acts what became of those men. And in truth, he doesn't even give us much regarding what Saul was doing those three days except to say that Saul fasted. And there's one other thing Saul was doing, but we don't find out until we read this next part. Verse 10, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he, said, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And let this be one of the points you take home today. Should God in your life ever engineer events in such a, uh, such a way that one day you suddenly realize you've been wrong, then a very good thing for you to do is pray. If you have suddenly realized you've been wrong, too often what is our impulse? We defend. We make an excuse. We, we minimize it. Right? But what is most needed at a time like that is to humbly give God the space to reshape your thinking. Because you've been wrong. Acts 9, verse 11 the Lord told him, go to the house of Judah, Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias had a good reason to be surprised at the command he was given. But as is true with all true believers, Ananias had even better reasons to do what the Lord commanded. 
Sometimes we have reasons to think, Lord, why are you asking me to do this? But if we truly have walked a life of faith, we know we have even more reasons to do what the Lord said, even if it didn't make complete sense at the time. And as a good faithful servant, Ananias, at the Lord's command, immediately sought out the very man, dare we say, the evil man, Ananias immediately sought out the very man he likely would have thought the day before he should try to hide from. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, heretic Saul, no, no. He said, persecutor Saul, evil man Saul, What did he say? Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may, two things, see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting saying. One that takes me in my mind back to those words of Jesus that we started with, John 16, Verse 7, Jesus said, if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. What Jesus has described would happen when the Holy Spirit comes is exactly what Saul has just experienced. And the convictions that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would bring are the convictions that have come upon Saul. So one of the things we've been asking ourselves in this series is the question, what would I become if the Holy Spirit fell upon me? And based on Jesus' words recorded by John and on this story of Saul, one of the things you can likely count on when the Holy Spirit comes upon you is that you will realize you've been wrong. This is not something unique to Saul. This is exactly what happened in Acts 2 when Peter preached under the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember the words? Acts 2, verse 37. When the people heard Peter's words, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have tended over the years to rob the word repent of its meaning, turning it into kind of an external technical word instead of it being the very personal reality it must be. But in its most simple meaning, to repent is to realize before God that you've been wrong and desire to not be wrong any longer. It's pretty simple, right? Except I hate finding out I've been wrong. But finding out I have been wrong is one thing that happens when the Holy Spirit comes in power. It surely happened to Saul. Ellen White writes in Acts of the Apostles on page 118, For three days Saul was without sight and neither did eat nor drink. Those days of soul agony were to him as years. Again and again he recalled with anguish of spirit the part he had taken in the martyrdom of Stephen. With horror he thought of his guilt in allowing himself to be controlled by the malice and prejudice of the priests and rulers even when the face of Stephen had been lighted up with the radiance of heaven. When we're wrong we go blind. In sadness and brokenness of spirit, he recounted the many times he had closed his eyes and ears against the most striking evidences and had relentlessly urged on the persecution of the believers in Jesus of Nazareth. Remember that? 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. When we're wrong, we go blind, we go deaf, we can't see. The conversion of Saul is a striking evidence of the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to convict men of sin. Jesus had said, John 16, verse 8, when the Advocate, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So I ask you, have you been wrong? It's never fun finding out you're wrong. One of the things accomplished in us when the Holy Spirit comes upon us is that we realize we are sinners. We have done wrong. And we have been wrong. And it is in that moment when the Spirit is upon us in power that we have to make a choice. Either we reject the Holy Spirit and fight off the conviction upon us to repent and believe, or we confess that the conviction is true and we commit our lives to Jesus. Two options. Both choices remain for us every time And yes, just because you submitted to the Holy Spirit once doesn't mean you will not face new conviction time and time again. For you see, we are never truly ready for the Spirit to truly reveal it all to us. We couldn't handle it. Both choices remain for us every time. When conviction comes, to reject or to confess. I don't care how long you've been a believer. The Holy Spirit still comes upon you and brings conviction in your life. Stephen had said near the end of his speech to the Sanhedrin in Acts 7, verse 51, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors, You always resist the Holy Spirit. Is Stephen talking to us today? How long have you resisted the Holy Spirit in your life? You know, I could tell you something was right or tell you something was wrong and you could either agree with me or not. So I'm not going to tell you that. I'm just going to ask you, what is the Holy Spirit saying to your heart right now? Is there an area in your life where you've resisted the Spirit for years? Maybe it's just at that first step. You've never really committed yourself to Jesus. You've never really repented, confessed, and sought to follow Jesus. Going through the motions. The Spirit's been calling you. But you haven't wanted to leave that other thing. Well, that other thing is wrong, the Spirit says. Follow Jesus, the Spirit says. Maybe you've been a believer a long time. But there's an area in your life. I'm not saying it's making you lost. That's God's deal. In fact, this whole thing is God's deal. It's the Holy Spirit deal. Is He speaking to your life? And let me just tell you, He speaks into my life sometimes, and sometimes it's the last thing I want to hear. Because I feel justified. Or I don't want to do that. But I think that's what makes me stiff-necked. How long have you resisted the Holy Spirit in your life? Is today the day you need to stop resisting? 
So we're going to sing a song here as we close our service. And Evan's going to come out and join me here in a minute. It's one of those songs that goes with these questions. And I say to you as you reflect on this song as we sing it, does anyone here today need to repent? Does anyone today need to be baptized? I don't know where you are in this journey, but I do know that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, He brings conviction into our life because there are none of us that are doing everything right. But if there is a serious point where you've been resisting the Spirit and you know you have, and I'm not saying this applies to everybody and I'm not picking on anybody, but if there is a point and you know what the Spirit is saying to your heart right now while we sing this song, I want to invite you to come to the front. We don't do this all the time. But I believe today the Holy Spirit is coming with a convicting power. Don't resist the Spirit. As we sing this song together, come to the front, and we will close with a special prayer.